you today, it's not about how fast you run, but it's about finishing the race with strong faith. In this race that we run, you gotta have endurance, cause it's a marathon. I was born, join up to win, in pursuit with faith. Until the end, I'm going to have a
good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. So far the scripture. Come on and give the Lord a praise in this place. Come on and lift up his name. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Serve him with gladness. Come on, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. The Lord has been gracious and kind to us. Uh, another day he woke you up clothed in your right mind. Oh, you owe him a praise this morning. The power of God when they said it to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Is that is your testimony? Come on and clap those hands for Jesus. Uh, come on and shout unto the Lord with the voice of triumph. Uh, Lord, we thank you this morning for your goodness. Uh, we thank you for your kindness. Let the song of the Lord rise among us. 
Rise, let the song of the Lord rise, let the praise of our King rise. Come on, let's continue to give God a great praise. Let the song of the Lord rise, let the song of the Lord rise, let the praise of our King rise, let it rise.
Jesus. Uh, I didn't even have time to muster some words. Uh, all I can say was Jesus. Uh, Jesus. Oh, glory. It could have been another way. It could have been another way. But God's grace uh, and his mercy. Glory be to God. I thank God for life. I thank God that I can breathe. Huh? You don't know what it's like till you can't breathe. Huh? Glory. Huh? I'm not on a ventilator. Huh? Oh, I don't know about y'all. Huh? I don't take it for granted. I was glad when they said unto me, huh? let us go into the house of the Lord. I need you to clap your hands up. I need you to open up your mouth and give the God of your salvation husband of my son. Hallelujah. Let your glory rise. Let your presence rise. Thank you, Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. It's power to you who are listening in the name of Jesus. I dare you to call on that name when you have no other name, when you don't know who else to call. I promise you, he said, call unto me and I will answer. Call on the name of Jesus. Uh, it is in that name we praise him. You can clap your hands again for the name of Jesus. Oh, glory. They said, ba 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 for the name of Jesus. The God who died for you and me. The God who went to Calvary. Glory for you and me. You to clap your hands up for the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Great I Am, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I need you to clap your hands up and open up your mouth. Oh, He is Lord. He is Lord. He is Lord over your life. Lord over your family. Lord over this church. We crown you King Jesus. 
for Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We're going to move on. Hallelujah. We're going to move on. Hallelujah. But I feel the presence of the Lord. I just wanted to remind you the power of Jesus. The name of Jesus. It's in that name. That name. It's in the name of Jesus. It's all in his hands. It's in the name of Jesus. Our lives is in his hand. Our families are in his hand. Our children are in his hands. It's in his hands. He holds our present. He holds our future. His name is Jesus. Thank you, Father. We thank God for him. We ask God that you would strengthen him wherever he may be. May he replenish him, restore him. Amen. And to his wife, Lady Pamela Rochford, in her absence, we thank God for her, the woman that stands by his side. Amen. We thank God for our executive leadership, 
Dr. Melaine Rochford in her absence. To the woman of God, we thank God for her, for Pastor Joe Rochford II. We thank God for him. He should be coming shortly. And his wife, Tremaine, we thank God for our overseer curtain this morning. Amen. For all our leaders, our ministers, our elders, the Agnes, to all of you, God's people, and to you who is streaming, we greet you this morning. Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. At this time, we're going to move on with our service. We're going to have our general announcements coming from our minister, Jamel Clark. Let us receive him. Good morning, good morning. Announcements are as follows for Sunday, April 14th, 2024. Um, this uh, Wednesday, we will continue with our noonday prayer, our noonday prayer. Um, our DCC Leadership Conference is this week. Let's give it a hand clap for our DCC Leadership Conference. It will be from April 25th to the 27th. We are going to Tyson's Corner, Virginia. Um, if you haven't registered, it's not too late to register. You can scan the barcode outside. If you are... By the way, I will make this announcement now. If you're going and you're riding on the bus or the sprinters, I know it says 11 a.m. I want to be out of here by 11 a.m. So I'm asking everybody that is registered, be here at 10 a.m. Please, 10 a.m. If you know traffic, we're going to hit traffic. But the issue is we're taking, if we're taking a bus, it's a certain route they have to go. So that adds on another hour. I don't, let's be fair, people paid a lot of money. We want to get there on time. We want to be able to check in. You want to get the full experience. Please, I'm asking you. Don't worry. I'm going to call all y'all this week, but 10 a.m., all right? We want to leave at 10 a.m., and um, we're going to pray for travel and mercies, and everything is going to be great. Let's go. I think we have over 100 people registered, so they're coming from all over. It's going to be a good time, all right? And um, lastly but not least, we're with CCC. They're having their clothing drive. Let's give a hand clap for CCC. They're doing great things. Their clothing drive will be, and they're having a food giveaway and clothing drive on Sunday, on Saturday, May 4th at noon. Please, please, if you look outside, there's a list of things that are needed, specific things, because we have a lot of stuff you don't want to add up, and everybody has the same exact thing. There is a list out on the front desk, and you can also see um, any member of CCC, they will also let you know where you can help. And these are our announcements, and thank you very much. And we thank God for our announcements. Govern yourself accordingly. At this time, it's the best time of the service. It's giving time. Amen. Amen. God said he loves a cheerful giver. Amen. I'm going to read Malachi 3 and 10. Thank you, Lord. And it reads, bring the full tenth into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Test me in this way, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing for you without measure. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not ruin the produce of your land and your vine in your field will not fail to produce fruit, says the Lord of hosts. Then all the nations will consider you fortunate for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. So far the scripture. So let us prepare our hearts and minds to give this morning. Amen. At this time, the ushers will give you an envelope. If you choose to give by the envelope, we know on the screen is Cash App or New Life Cathedral. Give the fly, you can show there. But whatever it is, let God put on your heart this morning to be a blessing to the house of the Lord. We know this is a good place, amen. We know this is a place where we are about ministry in here and serving our community. So we want to be a blessing this morning. I am given by phone as soon as I find it. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So let us prepare our hearts to give. Thank you, Lord. And we want to remember today is the third Sunday. It's our 4545, the special seed orphan also. To those who are going to give that, you want to sow it today. Amen. That's the special seed orphan of $45 today. If you can, we want to be a blessing, and you want to sow that also today. So at this time, if you're preparing yourselves we can get ready to be led by the ushers and come up, even if you're sowing by phone, um, tap the basket that you're sowing your seed this morning. 
We, don't, we want to remember our leader, Archbishop. Amen. Even though he's not here, we want to be a blessing to our leader this morning. Remember his love offering also. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. sowing your seed this morning. Father, we thank you for those who had it to sow and those who didn't, Father. We pray, oh God, that you will bless them 20, 30, 100 fold. Give it back to them, Father, that you would keep them, keep their homes and their family, and that you will bless them abundantly to give again. We thank you now for this. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. At this time, I want to welcome any first-time givers, visitors, I'm sorry. I meant to welcome y'all before. If there's anyone here from the first time, I just want to acknowledge you, actually, that you stand. Amen. We thank God for our visitor. Amen. Thank you for joining us. You could have been in many houses, but you came to join us. We pray that this service would be enriched by it and that you will come back again and join us. The ushers would give you a handout so we can keep on our prayer list so you can keep in contact with you. Amen. Another visitor. I'm sorry. Well, can somebody greet our visitor in the side here? Amen. We thank God for you, you, and you. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, it's so good to see you. Look at the other neighbor and say, no, it's so good to see you today. Hallelujah. It's good to be seen, my mother used to say. <laughs> thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. So we thank God for all our visitors this morning. Amen. We know that you will be blessed this morning. At this time, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to some and present to others. None other. We have a preacher indeed that would give us a word this morning. It's none other than our pastor, Joel Rochford II. Having a senior moment. <laughs> We thank God for our executive pastor, Joel Rochford, to his lovely wife, Tremaine. We thank God for you. Amen. It is he that will deliver the word this morning. Amen. He will come to deliver the word. But right before he comes, we're going to have a selection from our one-man Levitical team this morning. <laughs> he is coming. God has blessed him. Amen. An anointed man. We thank God for you this morning. So it is he that come right after me, none other than our pastor, Joe Rocher, that will come. Amen. Come on, New Life. Let's get into a posture of worship so we can receive a blessing from the Lord. It says, you are Alpha and Omega, God. We give you worship. Can I hear you 
you say that? And continue to give God your worship. Continue to give God praise. We give you
Cause you are worthy. Oh, yes, you are God. for sweet nothings in his ear. God loves to inhabit the praises of his people. And so we can continue to tell him more about himself. Lord, you're worthy. Lord, you're honorable. Lord, you're accountable. Lord, you're faithful. Lord, you're merciful. Lord, you're kind. Lord, you're loving. Lord, I can't make it without you. I need you. Only you are worthy of the praise. Only you are worthy of the honor. Only you are worthy of my glory, God. We glorify your name this morning. We wouldn't do it for anyone else because no one else deserves it, but you deserve all the glory, all the honor and the praise. You're worthy to be praised. Come on, one more time we give you glory. else that took glory up. I cast down all idols. I cast down all vain imaginations. I lift you up above everything else. We give you Give God a shout of triumph. Come on, you can do better than that. You just said that you're everything to us. Give him a shout of triumph. Give him a praise from your belly. Give him a praise from your soul. Give him a praise from your whole being. We just told him he's everything to us, so our praise should reflect that. We just said you're everything. Nothing comes higher than you, so I can give you my praise. That's it, that's it, that's it. Just a few more seconds. Just press in. Just a few more seconds. This God is everything. He's the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. He starts it and he finishes it. He that began a good work in you will be faithful to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That he ain't gonna leave me hanging. That he's gonna see me through to the end. We thank God, we thank God, we thank God. We thank God you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. We worship God because we know that he did not begin a thing that he won't see through. That if God had a job description, it would be one word, and that word is faithful. Faithful. He's faithful to see it through. Sometimes people aren't accountable and they're not faithful, but God is always faithful. And that he will always see us through, no matter what. And so when we say you are Alpha and the Omega, we are prophesying to our future that God will see me to an expected end because there's nowhere that he is not. He's in my past, my present, and my future. And thus I say you're Alpha and Omega. That means that you will see me through to the end. Anybody glad about it? Anybody glad about it? Amen, amen. 
Surely the presence of the Lord is here. We thank God for his presence that we have already experienced during this service. And we thank God for everyone who was assembled here, the Archbishop in his absence, as well as uh, Lady Pamela. Come on, we can clap for him in his absence. It takes vigor, strength, and the Holy Spirit in order to pastor for over 45 years faithfully. Amen. We can give that a hand. Sometimes people don't start things and they don't do it for 45 days. 45 hours. 45 minutes. 45 years. Thank God for his faithfulness and his fidelity. Surely we thank God for the woman who stands by his side, Lady Pam, in her absence. We thank God for Overseer Curtain as well, the pillar of this house, always holding things together. We thank God for him. Thank God for Pastor Malene in her absence. She's actually traveling on assignment as well. She's in Dubai on a trip, uh, and she is a part of a coalition that is traveling the world to bring the good news to many different regions outside of the United States. And so we thank God for that. Amen, amen. Uh, I must thank my boo thing who's here with me this morning. And my beautiful daughter, Olivia, who is here. Um, also, thank you to the Levites. I believe it's uh, Brother Daniel. Brother Daniel, who led us into the presence of God. It's anointed minstrel. As well as Gene and, and Mike and Isaiah. Surely we must always give them honor that is due. It does not take, uh, or it takes rather a lot to do that week in and week out and constantly uh, surveying songs and, and what does God want to hear from his people. So we thank them for their prayer and deliberation uh, by holding up the music ministry. Um, I do not intend to be before you long, as I say. And um, I always say my, my motto is I'm here for a good time and not a long time. And so, um, and, and I want to take somewhat of an unconventional route um, this morning. I'm probably going to walk a lot more today because um, I really want to uh, convey uh, the sentiments of my heart uh, more recently in my prayer uh, and, and in my devotion. I, I have become more and more uh, inclined to see what the church overall, not just specific to new life, but the body of Christ and many uh, people who I have conversations with, like my wife, um, uh, Minister Jamel, Pastor Kim, and we're constantly talking about uh, the church and, and, and how we can uh, seek to improve, and um, not just this church, but just overall the body of Christ. We are a part of a universal body of believers and not just uh, specific to our church, New Life Cathedral. We are part of an overall body of Christ that is ecumenical. We have Pentecostals, we have Baptists, you know, we have Methodists, that we're all a part of the same body, but just in different forms. And I don't have a problem with that. Uh, but I begin to really just in my uh, devotional time seek what it is that the church is about. What is the church about? It's one of my, um, it's one thing to just come in week in and week out and to have service and to feel the presence of God. Um, but at the end of the day, what was Jesus' intent when he set it in place? And if he were to walk in our congregations, would he even recognize the thing that he founded? And I began to uh, just deliberate over that thought. And, and so I want to bring your attention to the book of Acts. The book of Acts. Uh, in our liturgical calendar, this is known as the fourth Sunday of Easter. The fourth Sunday of Easter. Um, not only do we celebrate the resurrection of Christ, but also we celebrate the acts of the apostles, or rather the acts of the resurrected Christ through the apostles. Um, and it is in the book of Acts that sets a clear template for us as to what the foundation and the function of the church should be. Amen, somebody? Amen, somebody. Amen. And so, Acts chapter number 4, verses 1 through 12. 
Acts chapter number 4, verses 1 through 12. And it reads, while P Peter and John were speaking to the people, the priests, the captains of the temple, the Sadducees came to them, much annoyed because they were teaching people and proclaiming that in Jesus there is the resurrection of the dead. And so they arrested him and put him in, them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who heard the word believed, and they numbered about 5,000. The next day, their rulers, elders, scribes, assembled in Jerusalem, and Annas and the high priest Capias John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they, had made, when they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they acquired, by what power or by, why, by what name did you do this? And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed, done by someone who was sick and are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, and it has become the chief cornerstone. There is no salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given by we must be saved. There is no other name under heaven given by we must be saved. Jesus, bless this word. Use me for your glory. and Hide me behind your resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Recently, um, I was actually listening to a, a podcast. Um, one of my favorite podcasts is one of, um, it's, it's known throughout our community, it's called Earn Your Leisure. And one of the tenets of this podcast, Earn Your Leisure, is really to highlight the lives of individuals within the African-American community who have ascended um, successfully, whether they climbed the corporate ladder through entrepreneurship, um, you know, started businesses, and they interview all sorts of people throughout uh, the African-American community that have done remarkable things. It could be athletes, it could be entertainers, but it could also be businessmen and women, um, entrepreneurs, and a number of uh, different people of note. Um, this one particular episode, there was a young lady who um, had made partner, by, I believe her name was Tanya, and she had made partner in her law firm. Tanya was from what would be considered the bottom. She's from the hood in New Orleans, and she had ascended um, up the corporate ladder, went to Ivy League, went to an Ivy League school, um, and she mentioned that she was raised by her grandmother. She was raised by her grandmother, who she called Mama Lou, affectionately. And Mama Lou uh, was a church-going woman. Um, she was also an elderly woman, of course, um, but she was also a very strong woman. And she instilled a sense of heritage and lineage into Tanya from a young lady. And so as Tanya began to matriculate through academia and began to climb uh, the corporate ladder, she found tremendous success based on the principles uh, that Mama Lou had instilled into her. And one of the things that Mama Lou had in her living room was a quilt. She had a quilt in her living room. And on this quilt, it was a colorful quilt, and it had different relics and things of the past from her entire family. So uh, a patch was made up of her mother's wedding dress. 
when she met her father. A patch was made up from her uncle who uh, stood on the, uh, the picket lines in Alabama when Martin Luther King uh, was, was protesting. And one was from Mama Lou with her uh, uniform as she worked at a hotel as a maid for over 45 years. And all of these things represented where Tanya had come from. It was hanging on the living room wall. And as Tanya began to become successful and she began to strive in, in, in corporate America, she became what everyone had instilled in her to become. She was a partner. She was by all means successful. She had a luxury high rise. She had all the signs and markers of success. But the thing I found interesting about her interview was that she said, through it all, she still felt empty inside. She still felt empty inside. And I know how that feels. I know many of you know how that feels. That, you know, you can kind of get so caught up in what you deemed as what was worthy to pursue. And you get so caught up in getting up in the morning and getting the kids ready for school and going to work and clocking in and doing a good job and then going to lunch and then coming back and finishing up your work and doing that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and having all of the markers of someone who's functional, high performing, achieving, accomplished, focused, but somehow feeling empty inside. And so Tanya in her story says that she went back to New Orleans to her grandmother's house and her grandmother could see it in her eyes that something was off. And you know how grandmothers do. She, she sat on the couch and she just patted the seat next to her and said, come sit down, baby. Come sit down. And Tanya sat down next to her grandmother and began to cry. And she said, I don't know why I feel like this. And her grandmother said something very interesting. Her grandmother said, you forgot about the quilt. You forgot about the quilt. That even though you've done all of these things, you are not just you. You did not come or create this in a vacuum. That this was something that was labored over, prayed over. Something that was intentional yet also organic. Something that the spirit allowed to move in our family and you stand now as a consequence of all of that. And so while you have all the markers of success, functionality, achievement, and people can look externally at you and marvel at where you've come from, you didn't just come from that. That you came from a praying grandmother who sat and worked 45 years in a hotel as a maid just so that you can have an opportunity. You came from an uncle who stood on the picket line so that you can have opportunities as a woman and as an African American to vote. You came from a mother who decided to have you and not to abort you and that you came from all of these things and not only did you come from something, now you must deposit to the next generation. That it's not just about where you come from, but it's also about where you're going and who's going to come after you. And the reason why that story stuck out to me is because I see a direct parallel when I look at the state of the church. When I look at the state of the church, and not just New Life, I'm not talking about New Life Cathedral specifically, I'm talking about just the church overall. That we are a body that has both a past and a future. And that we ourselves have forgotten the quilt. We ourselves have forgotten where we've come from, where we're going, and we begin to go and function with what seems like achievement and what seems like success. It's Sunday after Sunday, it's church services, it's stereotypical, it's status quo, it's this, then that, then that, then that, repeat. This, then that, then that, then that. It's the formula, it's formulaic, it is all of these things, but have we forgotten the quilt? And so when I read the book of Acts, the book of Acts serves as a tremendous template for us to remember exactly what that quilt looked like. 
Because as, as, I, as I said before, if Jesus were to walk in to our sanctuary, not only would he recognize what he created, but secondly, would he be welcomed? Would he be welcomed? How would we look at the carpenter who claims to have miraculous healing power and a direct connection to God, who doesn't have the best of the best clothing, is uneducated by all intents and purposes, did not go to the best of the best schools, did not have a home, was homeless and all of these things. How would we look at him if he walked into the sanctuary right now? And so where we find ourselves is in this text. As I said, the book of Acts is a template for the entire church, and this is our foundation. This is our upbringing. And what happened in this story is that Peter and John find themselves arrested. But why were they arrested? Somebody say, why? Why? Right? They were arrested because they had healed a man who was a beggar on the temple steps. They had healed a man who was a beggar on the temple steps. Peter and John were on their way at 3 p.m. to go to the temple, and they saw a man who was asking for alms, not unlike what we see on our subways, not unlike what we see by the Ombre on Atlantic Avenue or uh, anywhere you go in the Bronx, technically, or any of those other places. Like, it's just, like, it's rough, you know? It's rough. And so here's this guy who is at the temple steps every single day day every single day asking for alms and Peter and John say look at us as he's asking for alms now alms were just the currency of the day they he alms could be food it could be bread it could be um, money it, it just was whatever I can get to make it to the next day and so what Peter and John do they say silver and gold have I not but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus rise up and walk and it says and immediately his legs were strengthened, his ankles were restored, and he began to walk. But not only walk, he began to run, and he began to praise God. He began to praise God, and this was a miraculous sighting. This was something that the people marveled at because he was synonymous with this position of depravity. He was synonymous. He was known throughout the community as a guy who was always begging on the temple steps. I don't know how many of you take public transportation, but you know, sometimes you see the same person every day or every other day or every other week asking for money, every, that they become synonymous. Oh, that's the begging guy. That, that, oh, that's the homeless man that needs help. That's the person with the mental health condition. So he had become synonymous with this. And then he was healed. He was healed in the name of Jesus. But the problem with that is that that healing took place outside of the authority of the day, outside of the authority for the day. And they began to be upset and annoyed because now there was a movement within Jerusalem that they could not control. They had no power over it. They couldn't put a lid on it. They couldn't stop it. They just didn't understand what to do about it. And so the Bible says in the text that we just read, they were extremely annoyed by this. And what I would caution us, even at this point in the sermon, is that we always be mindful that God is always on the move. God is always moving. And lots of times as church people, we can be very susceptible that we won't recognize a move unless it looks like our move. We won't recognize it because they wear jeans or they may not meet on Sunday or there's no order to it or who do they think they are or there's smoke screens or there's LED lights or the music doesn't sound the same or they may have a little bit of a different theological twist than us or they may emphasize certain scriptures and not others but there's obviously a move of God going on but we won't recognize it because it doesn't look like our move and so they found themselves on the outskirts of the authority and now called into question. And so what I would wanna caution us is even with our collars, we are a high holy church and I, and I actually appreciate that. I believe that the order, the system and the structure allows us some sort of grounding and rooting 
so that we um, can have something to hold on to, particularly in times of crisis and in times where you have to be identified as who you are affiliated with, which is Jesus Christ. And so I believe that the protocol and the order and the clothes and the cloaks and the, and the robes all have a place. But I would also caution that we hold those things very lightly and with all humility because there are movements that don't look like ours. But the power of God is still there. That God is still moving amongst them and us and that we don't have to villainize it because it doesn't look like us. And so what happens is that Peter and John are called in front of the Sanhedrin. Now, mind you, this is after Jesus' resurrection, his, his ascension. And so this is, to me, one of the more profound proofs that resurrection did happen. This is one of the most profound proofs that resurrection did happen, because if you remember, what happened at the scene of resurrection is that Peter denied Jesus three times. Jesus died on a cross by himself. So my question when I look at it, because I went to seminary, and, and there's different schools of thought. Many people think that the resurrection, some find that it was physical, that Jesus literally rose. Some think it was uh, more of a metaphorical thing. There's another school of thoughts that says, oh, his, his friends moved his body. But symbolically, it meant that God raised him from the dead. That they teach you all of these things in seminary, and, and you have to, again, have a, as Bishop said last week, a firm place to stand. Because if you go in there, you'll come out thinking everything. Be just liberal. I don't know. It's all relative to each their own, or whatever it is. And so the reason why, I, and I would argue in class, that I believe that a physical re resurrection took place was because what happened to Peter? How did you, maybe a few weeks or months before, completely deny Jesus? Now you stand in this text as a completely transformed individual. Like what transpired so much that you were scared three months ago and now willing to die three months later? Like what happened? What happened? And so that is my contention that the physical resurrection of Christ took place. Because you see a complete 180 amongst the people who followed him that did not quite understand him while he was alive, but yet just a few moments later were willing to die for him. And he wasn't even there anymore physically. So what happened? That they experienced the power of the resurrected Christ. And that is the same power that we are called to experience today the same power that we're called to experience today. And so the thing about the Sanhedrin is that these were the same people who crucified Jesus. These were the small, select few of the Jewish elite that said, we would rather have Barabbas and crucify this Jesus. Because once again, that idea of he has a movement that we can't control. He doesn't adhere to the temple. He doesn't adhere to our Sabbath. He's healing people when he shouldn't be. He's meddling in our business. And guess what? He's bad for our business. He's bad for our business because the Sanhedrin were the high priestly family, and they were very, very, very rich, wealthy. And he was bad for business. And so they sought to put an end to his movement, just like they're seeking to put an end to John, John and Peter. But then Peter says something very boldly, and it says, and this is pretty much the contention of my entire sermon. It says, Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. So I'm a Pentecostal. We, most of us are, I mean, I hope so. We are all in a Pentecostal church this morning. But, but. We're Pentecostals, right? And so there's uh, uh, an allegiance to the moving of the Spirit through prophecy, right, and through special gifts. And we all believe that the Spirit does work and the Spirit does move. However, I do believe that we have a misconception when it comes to the Spirit as well. And so just simplified, the Spirit is simply the presence of God that gives us the strength to act out the will of God in our lives. That's it. That's it. 
Now, there are many evidences of that spirit. There's fruit, there's speaking of tongues, there's prophetic words and everything. But when you look at it, all the spirit is is the presence and the power of God in our lives that allows us and strengthens us to act out God's will for our life. That's it. And so you can speak in tongues. You can roll on the floor. You can shout. You can feel the spirit. But if there is no evidence in our lives that we have the strength and the power to live out God's will for our lives, then there is no Holy Spirit. It could be learned behavior. It could be emotionalism. It could be all of these things. But the Holy Spirit's job is to give us the strength and the presence to live out his will for our life. That's it. And this is the Holy Spirit that Peter is filled with in this text. He finds himself now standing in a high critical moment. Peter could have, by all intents and purposes, knowing that these are the people who killed Jesus, died in this instance. They could have said, we're going to crucify you because that was their job. They had to maintain order and control any rogue movements, anybody who came in that roused the people or excited them that could put their authority or Rome's authority into jeopardy, they would have to extinguish that. And so this was a critical moment where the stakes were extremely high for Peter. And he stands there empowered by the Holy Spirit to say the truth to power. Many of us who work in corporate America or even entrepreneurs who are raising children in this society of moral decline and and, and secularism or or face discrimination or or, or racism or unjust powers or unjust organizations and institutions, even sometimes in our very church, have this opportunity but also this obligation to speak truth to power, but not in a derogatory or demonstrative or demonstrative rather, way that it must be filled with the power of the holy spirit otherwise change doesn't come we see so many movements around our world defund this or pull that down and yes you know pull down patriarchy and and everything else And, and yes all good definitely because there have been abuses there's been manipulation there's been coercion there's been abuse on behalf of the powerful to take advantage of the less powerful but it has to be done with the spirit. It can't be done with the flesh. Because inevitably, if you do do it with the flesh, you become what you begin to ostracize. You become just as vindictive. You become just as manipulative. You become just as fear mongering. And it begins a cycle of perpetual chaos and abuse where you become not only uh, the person who was victimized, but you become the abuser themselves. That's why these types of movements must be handled with the delicate precision of the Holy Spirit. And so I want you to note that Peter does not diminish the Sanhedrin. He does not uh, become violent towards them. He does not um, become uh, belligerent, but rather just speaks what the Holy Spirit tells him to say in that moment. And that takes you back to Luke 11 where Jesus told his disciples, fear not when they bring you in front of the councils or when they bring you into the high courts. Don't even think about what you're going to say because my Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. But let me bring it down to even a more local level. We need the Holy Spirit in our households. We need the Holy Spirit in our homes. We need the Holy Spirit to get along with our spouses. The Holy Spirit will convict you to say, I'm sorry, when your ego will tell you to defend yourself. (laughs) Ask me how I know. (laughs) That the Holy Spirit will convict you to apologize. The Holy Spirit will convict you to say, all right, go the extra mile. She may be a little tired right now. The Holy Spirit will convict you how to resolve conflict in your home when your kids are fighting. And if you do it in your flesh, you may cause more harm than good. It'll teach you or show you what to say in that board meeting. 
when you have to confront discrimination or idiocy or, or any of the other things that we face, it'll show you how to move in a prejudicial society and in a culture without becoming the poison itself, that the Holy Spirit is there to guide and aid you and to reduce the brunt of the poison, but also help us to reverse societal norms. That's what the Holy Spirit does. It's not just for here. I want to pray. It's not just for here. If here is the only time you feel them, I hate to break it to you. You need more. If you can only exercise that gift within the four walls when you speak in tongues here and not when you're talking to that uh, abusive boss or, or when you're talking to that belligerent co-worker that don't do her work and then always got to you got to pick up the slack or you're talking to that subordinate that's always usurping your authority, that it also works in that context too. It works with the TSA agent that got the attitude. It works with the cashier that ring you up twice and then mad because you came back and said you charged me twice and then they huffing and puffing. It works in all of those instances. And he will show you what to do. It works when you're raising your children. It works when they come to you and say, how come Becky has two mommies? I don't understand it. It works in that instance. It'll tell you what to say. It works in that instance. It works when you get bad news. It works in all of these instances. And he will tell you what to say. And so Jesus, or rather Peter and John, talk to the Sanhedrin and being filled with the Holy Spirit they say that this was not done of our accord we didn't heal this lame beggar ourselves this lame beggar that you saw every single day on the temple steps begging you for something was healed by the power of the resurrected Christ healed by the power of the resurrected that that same power is what we have access to and so our main contention and I'm done our main contention this morning is accessing that power through the spirit accessing that power through the spirit we can't do what we do or what we're called to do without it without that spirit there's no reason for us to gather. The church is essentially planet fitness. Like it's just a social club. You work out, you can, you can come. You don't have to come, just pay your membership fee. You can work out or you could not. You could show up or you could not. But it's just a social club where we all have the ideal of a perfected body or a perfected self, but are not willing to do what God is calling us to do. And so the main contention that the text highlights is that the church's function, one and only function, is to minister to the broken. Ministering to the broken. That even though he was an afterthought in this text, the entire text was about him. This lame beggar who was broken, who people saw every single day and gave what they had to him or maybe just walked by him. It is about the broken. That's the reason we come. is so that we can be healed and that we can heal others. That's it. You know, we do church anniversary and we do concerts and, and, and we do seminars and conferences to learn and because that is one of the things that we do. We have to equip. But what are you equipping them for? The Bible says for the work of ministry. That's the reason you're going to leadership conference to be equipped to do more ministry. It's a good time. And yes, we do know that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And we're going to have a good time and convene and everything else. But we are being equipped to do more. We're equipped to do more. We're equipped to do more. We're equipped to do more. More ministry, more healing, more deliverance. Seeing more people set free. That's the reason why we come as I said if we don't we'll still gather 
we'll still convene, we'll still have a good time, and all of these things. But is this a gym? Is this a social club? Is this a bridge club? Or is this the church of the resurrected Christ that seeks to heal, deliver, and set free and continue the works that Jesus did? And he gave us the power and authority to do. We're here to minister to the broken. More recently, I began to just look at where we are as a society and a culture. And I I noticed a very deep contrast between the church that I grew up in and the culture I grew up in and the culture that we are in today. And when I was young, I was a teenager, I was very into apologetics. And apologetics is simply the defense of the faith. It is something that you learn in order to talk to someone who does not know Jesus or someone who might be from a different religion. And and you can somewhat have a a defense as to why you believe what you believe, which is all well and good. That's a a great thing. But I realized that that was because we were part of the age of explanation where we could simply explain things to people. You know, you see people uh, at the Broadway Junction handing out tracts because I'm going to explain to you what Jesus did. I'm going to explain to you why his blood is salvific. I'm going to explain to you why the cross is powerful and why you need to serve him and believe in him and how he died for the remission of your sins. I'm going to explain it to you. But I realized around the turn of the 21st century, we moved from an age of explanation to an age of demonstration. No longer is it suffice to just explain who Jesus is. I need to see it. I can't just give you a track, read this, say these three things, and you're now in the body of Christ. I need to see it. We are no longer in an age of explanation because you have Google at your fingertips on your phone. You got TikTok. You got Uh, snap and everything that our attention span is far too short and we have access to everything at our fingertips I don't need to explain but what I cannot argue is if I see a lame man that was seated at the temple steps every day now running and praising God that's the one thing I can't give an explanation for and so we have to move from explanation to demonstration and so when you go into your workplace what are you demonstrating When you go into your home, what are you demonstrating to your family? What are the things, not just the succession of things, but what was the transformational thing that God has done and continues to do through and out of your life that demonstrates that you have the power of the resurrected Christ in your life? And I'll be honest, sometimes that will put you up against the status quo. That when you begin to demonstrate, that comes with onslaught comes with enemies it comes with people who don't like what you're doing but what this text clearly shows and what by what happened what we celebrated four weeks ago with Easter is that when God is for you who can be against you when God is with you no enemy from hell can stand against you and so I'm going to ask everybody to stand stand And I'm going to ask you, and this is not a call for everybody, but if you, like me, desire to see more demonstration, to see more power, to see the church moving in its resurrected state as we continue the works of Christ. Now, if you want to continue with what we can do every single week and, you know, not necessarily have any, any uh, balance to it, so to speak. We're just going to come and just do church as usual and there's really no desire to see anything more of or from God. This is good enough for me. I've done that. I've been a part of mega movements and, and resurgences and resurrections and things of that nature. But if you desire like myself to see God move in unusual ways like he did in the book of Acts and move in very unprecedented ways 
like he did with the first church. I'm asking you to just join me at the altar and I'm going to say a prayer. Just join me at the altar. Now don't feel pressured to come. I saw a clip recently where somebody got kicked out of the church for not obeying and said, if you don't lift your hands, you got to get out. That's not that. This is not that. This is not that. However, I feel the unction and the desire to see more from God in this season and in subsequent seasons. Because if not, if we can't find a way to demonstrate it for a world that is in social decay where everything is permissible, everything's allowable, and everything is acceptable, if we can't lift up some sort of counterculture to add balance to the narrative, just like the young lady Tanya forgot the quilt, there won't be any more patches to build. There won't be any more. There won't be any more patches to add because the generation after us will no longer honor or value the things of God. They'll no longer honor or value it. It won't be of any consequence to them. And so I'm asking you, if everybody can just lift your hands and let's bow our heads. We're going to say a prayer that God begin to show us through his spirit what he wants us to do as individuals but also as a collective body that we don't want just church as usual we don't want business as usual that we want to see a demonstration of his power not only in our midst but in our lives I want to see relationships renewed I want to see households brought back together I want to see relationships estranged relationships reconciled I want to see things confronted in organizations and in our jobs where I can speak truth to power by the Holy Spirit and things begin to change, that tables begin to turn, that the balance, the scales of power begin to shift in my favor. And that is the same power that Jesus gave to his disciples. And I give you good news. It is the same power he gives to each and every one of us. But we can't do it by our might nor can we do it by our power. We can't do it by our intellect. We can't do it by our strategies and our protocol. We can only do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, God, I'm going to pray. Father God, we thank you for this time and this space. We thank you for this moment. We thank you for what you have done on Calvary, Lord. But not only that, we thank you that God raised you from the dead. And that same power that you raised up with is the same power you endow us with, God. So now, Lord, I ask that you show us and demonstrate your power in our midst, Lord. Show it to us in our homes. Show it to us in our jobs. Show it to us as we're on the highways and byways acting men that they come to us and say what must I do to know this Jesus that you know oh God that we are moving from an age of explanation to an age of demonstration will you begin to pour out your power and your anointing on us as we do all that you've called us to be that we we repent that we were not able to do it in our own strength we repent when we try to do it in our own strength we repent that we excluded you from your church Lord we repent that we excluded you from our lives and we held all sorts of vain idols and, and casting imaginations and things that were in our thought life and in our speech life and in our music and in our eyesight and what we ingested in TV and everything else that was so far and contrary to what you were calling us to. But God, we come to you today asking for a new discipline and a new strength by your Holy Spirit to read our word more, to pray more, to gather more, to fellowship more, to see your power demonstrated amongst us and in our midst. Let idols be cast down. Let financial idols be cast down. Success idols be cast down. Accomplishment idols to be cast down. Educational idols to be cast down. All the things that we thought were you, but were only a semblance of your power in our lives. And we ask this morning for the real power. We ask this morning for the real power. We ask this morning for the real power. The power of your Holy Spirit that allows us to do your will in our lives. And we know that if we stand by your word, and if we're fidelis to what you've called us to do, even though we stand amongst the rulers and the elite and the well-to-do, that no weapon formed against us will be able to prosper. No weapon 
formed against us will be able to prosper. No weapon formed against us will be able to prosper. And so we move now out of this service in new boldness and a new courage and a new strength and in a new understanding with a renewed mind that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. That we not forget it as we leave this service, but every single day we take time to remember you and to bend our ear to what your spirit is saying for us to do. Because we know that what is coming is better than what's been. That's your promise. That's your promise. We stand on that promise that what's coming is better than what's been. We stand on that promise that what's coming is better than what's been. And it's going to happen with the power that works in us. So we thank you, oh God. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for this word. We thank you for the example of the apostles and the power that worked through him. Let it work through us so that men can see that these people have been with the Christ. And we can demonstrate to a world that so desperately needs to see your power that you are real, you are resurrected, and you are able. We believe you for it. We believe you from it. If you believe that prayer, I want you to give God the best praise you can right now. Just give God the best praise you can right now. That God is going to demonstrate some things in my life and our lives and make us an example. He's going to heal some sickness. He's going to heal some incurable disease. He's going to turn my life around. He's going to turn my family around. He's going to turn my marriage around. He's going to reconcile some relationships. He's going to touch my finances. He's going to touch my grieving heart. Do me a favor, before you go to your seat, can you just hug your neighbor and just tell him I'm praying for you? We're in this together. I'm praying for you. We're in this together. The spirit in me testifies to the spirit in you. The spirit in me testifies to the spirit in you. The spirit in me testifies to the spirit in you. I dare not end any service without at least opening and acknowledging if there's anybody in our midst that wants to know this Jesus that we learned about today, that wants to know the power of the resurrected Christ in their lives, wants to become a part of the body of Christ and begin to work and exercise that power. It does not happen, as I said, without his spirit. And in order to attain his spirit, you must become a part of his family. So if you don't know Jesus, I actually open the doors of the altar right now. If you can come, if you can just be an evangelist on your row and ask your neighbor if you know Jesus, just ask your neighbor, do they know Jesus? I testify that it will be the best decision of your life. It will be the best decision of your life. Amen, amen, amen. Secondly, I would like to open up the doors of the church. If you're not currently a part of this uh, body of believers, this is a good house, amen? amen? It's a good house. If you're not a part of a body of believers, as I said in my sermon, we are on the move and we're seeking to hear the voice in the heart of God and be empowered by his spirit to make effect and real change in this world. And I would love for you, if you don't belong to this assembly of believers, to join us. If you want to join us, we want to do real work for the real risen Savior. And we would love for you to be a part of that mission that God has given us. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Amen. If there is no one, I'm going to cede my time. And thank you, New Life, so much for your time, this time and this space. I hope I said something that edifies you at least. Uh, something, a thing or two that edifies you and empowers you for your next, for your next move. 
Uh, we believe that God is doing something new, not only in this church, but also doing something new in his entire body and in this world. As Bishop has been saying, uh, for those who have been tuned in to Dialogues with Destiny, that these signs that we're seeing with earthquakes and, and eclipses and some of everything else uh, is a part of, a, a, of another move that God is ushering in and he's sending us signs and wonders in a very uh, frequent and, and demonstrative fashion. And so we don't want to miss out on what God is doing. But New Life, I love you. Thank you so much for this time and space. Now into the hands of the very capable overseer curtain. Come on, give him a hand as he comes. Well, we give the Lord glory today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I think somebody still feel that residue of praise worship in your spirit amen the lord is good hallelujah in the book of ezra when they found the law and they began to preach the scripture says and they bowed their faces to the ground and began to worship when we hear such a powerful astounding word of the lord our response is to worship the God of our salvation. Trust God and believe him that what was preached will be partakers of that preached word, will be doers of that word and not just hearers of that word. Amen? Amen. Let's give God praise for that powerful message from my executive pastor, Joe Rochford II. We thank God. Thank God for you, you and you. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. We're going to leave. Y'all looking at me like, come on, stop talking over here. <laughs> Amen. The clock got to strike 12 midday before. <laughs> this is a Cinderella moment at 12. Amen. Praise the Lord. But we're thankful to God for his goodness. We want to be a blessing to this young man of God today. And I would ask each and every one of you that can. Amen. I need at least 50 people to give me $10. Amen. Amen. Come on and seed into his life. Let's be a blessing to him. Amen. Amen. He's a husband. He's a new father. Amen. And he works very diligently and very inspectfully uh, towards the work of the Lord and making sure that the house of God is well kept and well provided for. We want to be a blessing to him today. Amen. Amen. So come on and be a blessing. You, you, and you. You can come out from where you are seated. Amen. Every adult, give your child at least a dollar to come give to the offering. Teach them how to give to the house of God and to the men and the woman and the people of God. We trust the Lord for his goodness, his love and kindness, as our musicians will give us some good giving music. Praise the Lord. the city Help the musicians as they play. I, I need your voices to be lifted. Come on, we're blessed, we're blessed, we're blessed. Sing it like you're blessed this morning. That's right. We're leaving out of here rejoicing because we're blessed. This week shall be a blessed week. This week shall be filled with breakthrough. This week shall be filled with blessings. This week shall be filled with the bounty of God. 
I need you to lift your voice. Come on. This is going to be our benediction today. We're blessed. We're blessed. We're blessed. Come on, streets. Church of the living God. Come on. Come on. Come on. Let's make one big choir. Yeah. Bless when we come. Bless when we go. Blessings all around us. Blessings all over me. Blessings in my home. Blessings on my job. Bless while I walk down the street. Bless. We're blessed. All these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Says Deuteronomy 28. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Goodness and mercy following us all the days of our life. Come on, son. Take us home today, because we're blessed. What you say, Davida? We're blessed. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor I'm blessed. Come on, communicate with the one next to you. Tell them I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. Hallelujah. I refuse to be stressed because I'm blessed. Oh, glory. Cast it down today. Cast down poverty. The devil is defeated. Hallelujah. Everybody oh, say glory. Bless, yes. Bless. We're blessed. Bless. Hey, bless. Come on, y'all. Come on. Put some pep in your step. Lift it up and say bless. Put something in your hips this day. <laughs> Woo. Glory. Hallelujah. Everybody We're say leaving bless. out here rejoicing bless. because we are blessed. We're blessed in. We're blessed in. We're blessed. We are blessed. We're blessed <laughs> Don't ever tell yourself you're not blessed. We Hallelujah. When the devil try to Sing tell you you ain't going to be nothing, ain't but nothing going to come out of your life. You talk we back to that spirit and said, I'm blessed. We're blessed in the city. We're yeah. blessed. We're blessed when we, we are blessed. Cast down every stronghold. Well, Everything that ain't like God. Pull it down. You're looking at me. I still dance, but I change partners. Anybody still dancing? But you just change your partner. Late in the midnight hour. Late in the midnight hour. It's a turnaround, y'all. Anybody sense a turnaround? Turn around, turn around, Joe. It's a turnaround. God is turning it. It's going to work. God is turning it. And I prophesy you're going to see a turnaround. He's going to turn it around. He's going to work in your place. All right, God, we worship you. We adore you. We give you glory. Let your will be done in our lives. Lead us and guide us by your divine power, your presence, your protection, your peace, and your provision. Remember Archbishop as his apostolic assignment. Keep him, cover him, and let your will be done in his life. Knowing him with fresh oil to minister to the people of God. Bless the minister that ministered today. Keep him, protect him and his family. Bless us all, we pray, in that powerful and mighty name of the resurrected Christ. Jesus is his name. And there's no other name under the heavens whereby we must be saved but the name of Jesus Christ. And all of God's people said amen, amen, and amen. Late in the midnight hour. <laughs> it's gonna turn God's going to turn it around. It's going to work in your favor. It's working. It's working. 